Hi folks, book haul time again. Uh, I've been, <laughs> I don't normally do weekly book hauls, but I have been super profligate recently. So uh, I need to catch up so I can clear the pile and put them on some shelves which don't exist yet. I'm gonna start with books that I found at the paperback book fair last Sunday. Uh, it was um, relatively restrained on my part. I think um, I could easily have come away with hundreds of books there, but uh, as you'll see, there are, there are maybe 10 or 15. Um, I'm going to show you first a little bit of footage that I took whilst I was at the show. I had the notion that I would be able to sort of video my browsing, but it was such utter chaos that that kind of went out of the window, and as you will see. Just wanted to give some sense of the chaos here. It's absolutely packed. It's loads of people. This is this is Dorset Bob's stall, famous Dorset Bob. And um, you, need shell pel you need sharp elbows today. It's um, apparently much busier than it was last year. Um, there was a queue around the corner to get in at half past nine when it opened and um, it's been a bit mental actually. I bought one book, I bought one book. It's absolute chaos. <laughs> I shall see you later. So like I say, sharp elbows were required and um, it was like your worst jumble sale nightmare uh, at times. But um, but that serves me right for going at the beginning. Uh, and, but I did think I picked... So I went in with a list of things that I was going to look for. I was going to look for some missing pan lozenge books. I was going to look for some Venture SF. I was going to look for a couple of John Wyndham titles. And then any kind of New England library books from the 70s with the, with the nice covers. In the end, I didn't find much of any of that except for the New England um, covers. So I'm going to show you what I did find um, in my random in my random browsing. Let's see. So the, the famous uh, Dorset Bob, um, who often features on Steve Outlaw Booksellers channel, um, was there with a the stall uh, at which Steve and Jules Burt were both helping. So I was able to say hello to both of them, which was nice. Um, I got a few things. Um, I got a really nice copy of The Furies, um, which I do have a copy of. I read it recently, but it's a pretty tatty one, and this is much nicer. It's the uh, kind of 1960s pan. I say 60s. I think it, I'm not going to get out of his packet so to show you, but this is essentially mint. Uh, it's got a really cool picture, as you can see, of um, of a giant wasp. I'm not sure if he's if he's carrying away a man or, or just kind of eating his head off. <laughs> there was quite a lot of that in the book, but it's a really nice copy um, and uh, pretty much flawless. It did cost me a fiver but it's in pretty nice condition. And then I bought, slightly randomly, a couple of Zena Henderson books, who is a female author that I've, I'd only recently heard of, but apparently is, is pretty good. Um, so this is Pilgrimage, which reminds me a little bit of um, Lee Brackett's Tomorrow. It looks like a sort of bucolic uh, scene. Um, across the black highways of space they came from an alien planet that many ge generations before had suffered a terrible natural disaster. A few have managed to escape to Earth, and now, unknown to the Earth people, their descendants are living ordinary lives in Cougar Canyon, an isolated rural community in the American West. But the people, although resembling human beings in appearance, have strange telepathic powers that enable them to perform fantastic supernatural feats. So maybe there's an element of um, John Wyndham's The Chrysalids in there as well. Anyway, sounds interesting. That was that cost me six quid, which is way more than I would normally pay for a for a paperback but these are in mint condition so you um you know you you pay you pay a premium for that and fair enough uh next i got um another 60s edition of um the anything box by zena hansen in the pan not in the pan in the panther science fiction this would also have been from the late 60s it's priced in shillings and pence and um i i yes this is a short story collection I didn't think it was a novel, short story collection. On a different stall, I got, um, because I like the cover, uh, Three Eyes, which is, uh, I initially thought was a short story collection, but it's actually volume three in what I think is a four volume series. The first of which is called One Eye, the second of which is, can you guess, called Two Eyes. And then there's Three Eyes, and I believe, inevitably, Four Eyes is the final. Um, Oh, actually, sorry, beg your pardon, Three Eyes is the third and final, but the first two are called One Eye and Two Eyes. Um, so I don't know much more about that. And then I picked up, I uh, was pleased to pick up Machines and Men by Keith Roberts, again in pretty much mint condition. It cost me uh, three quid. So this is this is actually a short story collection as well, containing, let's see, Keith Roberts injects his own brand of immediacy and realism through his punchy, readable style in his considerable and his considerable technical know-how on into these stories. Ten rare new gems in the dazzling treasury of science fiction. Excellent and imaginative, um, apparently. Um, so this is from 1973, and um, it's a first printing, and according to the note on the back, it is lightly creased on the spine, although I can't see any evidence of that. 
super duper. On my one experience of Keith Roberts, I'm keen to read more. And let's see. I picked up, slightly speculatively, because I, I actually already have a copy of this, um, Capella's Golden Eyes by Christopher Evans, which was his first book, I believe. And it's in the Granada. And this is this is in pretty much mint condition. Certainly, yeah, very strong, very good. Um, I already have it, and I just bought it in case my copy was not in as nice a condition as this. And I, th and I think this is nicer, but frankly not a lot nicer but you know it was three quid not a big deal i got um ray bradbury the october country which which i already have a copy of um, although this is a nicer um edition um so again uh, but that can that cost me seven quid so i must have been at that stage i must have been in a, in a bit of a book frenzy and uh kind of blinded um by um you know i'd lost all, lost the pattern of myself in the <laughs> in the free-for-all um, and uh, was pleased to just pick this up just because I like the cover. So any pretense at checking my spreadsheet to find out what I had um, and any any restraint at that point had um, gone. I think I was getting fatigued at that point and ready to, ready to leave. And then what I have left were all new English library uh, books from the 70s with the um, lovely covers. And I, I really just bought them because I, I like the covers um, and it's sort of irrelevant who it was by although there was some method to my madness so this one is to outrun doomsday by kenneth bulmer which is rather splendid it's got a pterodactyl on it who doesn't love a science fiction dinosaur and then uh lester del rey the sky is falling we must tell the king another Kel another ken bulmer this time stained glass world and then michael moorcock lord of the spiders because it's got bat faced spiders on the cover why not and then I got, um, I was pleased to find a few for not exorbitant money. Well, actually that's not the case in one in one case, but um, a few of the Edgar Rice Burroughs books, two of the Mars series and one Venus, um, which I'm interested to get. I had a couple already, but I'm interested to get after doing my video on Barsoom um, a few weeks back. So I've got, and these are the ones with the Bruce Pennington cover. So this is um, Fighting Man of Mars book something or other five or six or so, i can't remember it's it's um later in the series anyway if i remember rightly so that's rather splendid scantily clad lady on the front there's a pattern developing here uh this one is gods of mars which is the second book in the mars series again hugh pennington cover and then the final one is lost on venus which is the second book in the venus series and um it must be pretty warm on venus because this good lady is not wearing many clothes Uh, so that so that's almost everything that I picked up at the paperback fair. But in a slight anomaly, I was persuaded by certain individuals who should remain nameless to pick up this, which is the rather weighty Encyclopedia of Science Fiction um, by Clute and Nichols, which is the authoritative source of the skinny on basically everything science fiction. Um, so long as it was written by 1993 because this that's when this edition um is from apparently it's all online now so the updates are, are in the online version but it's but when i when i brought it home my kids were like oh brilliant can i have a look has it got any pictures and the answer is no it's all solid text it's all data and information um and i haven't had a chance to look through it yet but um but allegedly once i do I could be there for hours and um, it could, quite, could get quite expensive because I think I'll end up going down rabbit holes and finding out about books that I didn't know about, um, which, will, which will lead me to um, the online emporiums that I frequent. Um, so that is enormous. Um, a very nice resource to have that I'll flick through from time to time. I may even use um, it actively. And that was a fiver, so it can't be bad although it was rather heavy to carry home. So that's everything that I got at the at the paperback book fair. So like I say, although I did lose a little bit of restraint towards the end when I started to get um, a bit dazed by the whole thing, uh, generally speaking, I didn't come away with all that many books, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably good for my wallet. So what have we got here next? So uh, a week or two back, I found... Um, I think it was on my trip to Yorkshire. I found one of the venture science fiction books from the 80s. And um, at the time I said that I you know, wasn't going to pursue them online. I would just kind of come across them over time um, and add to my collection when I found them in nice condition. Um, and then completely ignored that and ordered four online. Um, uh, with the risk that you inevitably take when you order online that the condition isn't quite what you expected. So 
Um, we've got book 11, The Black Collar by Timothy Zahn, and this is rather creased on the spine. That's number 11, as I say. And then I've got number 17, Cobra Strike, which is one of three Cobra-related books, by, again, by Timothy Zahn. So these books were all published in the 1980s. They were all first-time paperback issues in the UK, and they were all of a sort of space adventure slash space opera kind of um, thing with a bit of military science fiction thrown in. So they're all, they're all meant to be page turners, basically. I, I just like the um, the format and the livery of them. And then I've got Run, Come See Jerusalem by somebody called Richard Meredith, uh, which again is a bit creasy on the spine, so not brilliant condition. And then finally, uh, Space Skimmer by David Gerald with one of these annoying stickers that I'll have to soak off because there's a price tag on it that they didn't want you to see. And probably for like 50p or something. Um, so I've got, so I've already got two, so I've now got six and there are 25 in total to collect. I may be here sometime. And then I've got some, let me grab them. I've got some charity shop finds um, in my local Oxfam bookshop in Woodley, which I went to last weekend. It's A Van Vogt, Quest for the Future, which was a, a nice little bag, which is pretty unusual for that shop, but uh, they must have come to them in their collection like this. So this is in basically mint condition. Uh, it's another New England library book, and I've got a bunch of Van Votes in that livery, and I've worried that I might already have this, but according to my spreadsheet, I didn't, and I, indeed I do not, or I do now. Um, I got, I was pleased to get, in fact, uh, Joan D. Vingy's The Snow Queen, which is a um, very well thought of book. It's in okay condition, it's got a bit of a crease on the spine, but it's otherwise in good nick. According to Arthur C. Clarke, a future classic, it has the weight and texture of June. Ariane Rod, as beautiful as she was ancient, she ruled Tiamat, whose twin sons circled the Stargate, linking her world with the Empire. Now the Stargate was closing, heralding the end of winter rule. But Ariane Rod, faced with ritual sacrifice, has cloned an heir, her key to immortality and perpetual dominion. The Snow Queen will defy the laws of the galaxy for the fountain of youth kept flowing by genocide and the power of love. So they flip between winter and summer rule. It's kind of like Game of Thrones, long seasons. So there is a Snow Queen and a Summer Queen, normally. Uh, apparently, very richly detailed and um, compelling kind of world building, and I'm looking forward to reading that. Looks good. I found some books I already have, but I was but I was compelled to buy it because these ones were in a slipcase. So this is the original Foundation trilogy in the Panther um, from the 1970s with the Chris Foss covers, and it, this has two elements of the triptych that are on the covers on the outside. And I bought it because of the A, because it's in a slipcase, but also the slipcase is in really nice condition. And then what I did was, among the two copies of the trilogy that I now have, um, I've picked the best um, condition books to go in the slipcase, and I'm going to jettison the other three. Um, and so I now have all three of those in better condition than I originally had in some cases, and I have it in a slipcase, which will keep them nice and um, is a nice thing in and of itself. Then in the same shop, I got Where the Late Birds Sing by Kate Wilhelm, which I um, haven't read, don't know anything about, but I have heard it mentioned in um, hushed tones. It's meant to be very good. So let's see. The Sumner family can read the signs, the droughts and floods, the blighted crops, the shortages, the rampant diseases and plagues, and above all, the increasing sterility all point to one thing. So it sounds like an end of the world type thing, which I'm always up for. Uh, their isolated farm in the Appalachian Mountains gives them the ideal place to survive the coming breakdown and their wealth and know-how gives them the means. Men and women must clone themselves for humanity to, su to survive, but what then? So um, so this is apparently according to Locus. Entertainment, extrapolation, believable characters, narrative drive, subtleties, more ideas. Whatever science fiction should provide to stimulate your imagination, Kate Wilhelm does provide in Where Late the, S the Sweet Bird Sings. So I already like the sound of that. I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, and then I found a bunch of Terry Patchett Discworld books, which... I'm not obsessed about finding, um, but if I find them in really nice condition, then I'm adding them to my shelves and gradually I'll get a full set. So this is one that I'm not um, motivated to find online. I just come across them from time to time. So this is Reaper Man. And it's in pretty much perfect condition. Then we've got Guards Guards, also in really nice condition. Some of these are first edition paperbacks and some of them are reprints. And then we've got Small Gods. So I think those first three are all first edition paperbacks for what it's worth and then moving pictures which i think is a um uh, a reprint so it's four four disc worlds to add to my collection i must have about 20 of them now maybe uh, a few of them in hardback but most of them in the uh, the paperback with the covers by ujima flip but i always forget josh kirby and then a couple more from that um expedition as ursula kayla Gwynn's planet of exile 
which was a Hugo and a Nebula Award winner for 1970. I'm not sure if it's that the book that was the winner or Ursula K. Le Guin. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Um, when the sun shrank and the snows came, the humanoid hilfs left their nomadic life and dug themselves into winter cities to escape the cruel cold and the menace of the wild hordes of the Gaal, who each autumn streamed south away from the frozen lands. Behind the walls of Landin, the dwindling colony sought refuge too from a winter that could last 15 of the years of Earth, from which they had come 600 years previously. The Hilfs feared the colonists, who they called Farborn, and suspected of strange powers. Their Earth kept the lost colony lone. Their fear kept the lost colony lonely. But the Earthmen knew their only hope of survival through that last long, terrible winter was to join forces against their common enemy, the ravaging Gaal and the eerie praying Snowgulls. Join forces or be annihilated, lost forever on their far planet of exile. So that's a very slender novel. I would guess under 150 pages. Yeah, 125 pages. Jolly good. Ursula K. Le Guin's writing is always excellent. And then Kenneth Laumer, uh, Retief and the Warlords, which I don't know much about. So I think I think this is not. I think there are other Retief books. I'm not sure if this is a second or a later book in that series. Certainly not the first. Uh, I had a visitation a couple of Sundays ago from of uh, the infamous Dave of Tilehurst, who um, popped over to bring back a few books that he'd borrowed from me um, to read, and then to take a couple back with him. Um, but he dropped off a couple of books that he'd ferreted out somewhere in his house. Um, so it's Frank Herbert's I, which is a collection of short story fiction, and there's obviously a, a bit of a June vibe going on um, here. Included are his own favourite story, the story that introduced one of his most famous characters, and a fable published for the first time, The Road to June, a unique collaboration between Herbert and Hugo award-winning artist Jim Burns, is a guided tour of his most invented world, and a must for all the many millions of June fans. So I don't know, are there, that strongly implies that there are illustrations in it. Oh, there are. Look at that. And I've just noticed that there's a character here who I initially thought was called Bellend, which appealed, to, which appealed to my pure iron imagination. If you're in the States, that might not mean anything, but it's funny here. Uh, take my word for it. Uh, and then he also um, donated to my library um, a hardback edition of Brian Aldous's Galactic Empires, Volume 2. I have these in paperback somewhere. I haven't actually read them yet. It's a short story anthology um, involving, surprise, surprise, Galactic Empires. And that's got stories in it by uh, A. Van Vogt, Algis Budris, James Blish, Avram Davidson, Harry Harrison, Paul Anderson, amongst others. Um, and I'm sure it's got an introduction by Brian Aldous himself, it does. So it's uh, it's, it's, an ex it's slightly um, tatty, to be honest. It is um, ex-library, um, but still, it's nice to have a, a hardback edition of those. So thank you to Dave for donating yet more books. Um, I, last, su last summer, for those of you new to the channel, Dave um, very kindly gave me something around 300 mostly vintage paperbacks from the 60s and 70s and some in the 80s that he collected himself over the years and, and was um, just making some room in his home office so um, I very gladly took possession of those and uh, we've stayed in touch okay uh, there follows a few books that I ordered online um, this one uh, Gregory Benford Across the Sea of Suns which is book two of the Galactic Center series of which there are six in total I bought this um, on um, AB Books, and it was from a seller in the US. It was described as very good, and the under the underlying book, which I suppose is the important thing, is is very nice. It's quite nice. It's it's quarter bound, cloth bound, very nice. But the cover, well, the jacket, I'll just put back on, is um, is a bit moth eaten. It's got um, some sticker residue on it. It's pretty tatty at the corners and the bottom edge. It's got a tear there, and the top is very kind of um, knackered, basically. Um, so I, I wrote them a perfectly polite email saying this is a little bit disappointing, not what I was expecting. It's certainly not very good, or at least the dust jacket isn't. And to be fair to them, it wasn't any quibbling. Um, they pretty much immediately came back to me and said, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, it's not what you uh, wanted. Um, and they just gave me a full refund. So can't be bad. I uh, This was the only one of the Galactic Center series that I was missing in hardback. Um, I, and I think I have one or two of them in paperback as well. So I know, I know excuses now. I have the full set. So at some point I will get around to, to reading them. Uh, they're meant to be hard science fiction, but, but pretty good with it. So that one, it did. It initially cost me a few quid, but I did get full refund, so it's effectively zero pounds. Uh, this one was not zero pounds. Um, I paid way more than I normally would for uh, a hardback online. Um, I've only done this once or twice, but it was Dark Eden by Christopher Beckett, by Chris Beckett rather. Uh, and I was sort of like a dog with a bone with this one. I've got the follow-on to Mother of Eden and Daughter of Eden in hardback, and I've got the first of them, this one, Dark Eden, in paperback. 
And so I was kind of neither fish nor fowl. I either, I either needed to get a full set of the paperbacks or to get a full set of the hardbacks. And whilst books two and three are quite easy to find in hardback and not very much money in pretty good condition, the first one didn't have a very long print run and um, many of them went to libraries. And so they're actually pretty unusual to find in hardback in nice condition. And uh, you, you can pay anywhere between 50 and 80 pounds for them in really nice condition in fine so uh, i found this one and i and having been informed of that i kind of i snapped it up when i saw it because this one was for sale for 25 pounds plus postage so just you know maybe 28 pounds something um all in um and it is in near fine condition i would say it's got a little bit of a crease on the bottom of the spine which the bookseller was kind enough to tell me after i paid for it they sent me some photos to check if i still wanted it which is a very good um and i oh, i was happy to proceed on that basis especially as it was under half the cost that I've been led to believe I might pay. And if you if you have a look online, you'll see it. It's it's typically listed for well over £50 and quite often more. Um, and if it's signed, um, you know, you're paying hundreds. So so that's a pleasing addition to the shelves. And if I consider that this one eventually didn't cost me any money, then this one wasn't as painful in the end. And I really must read the others now. I really enjoyed the first one. And then I got, uh, I was looking at my Ken, Ken McLeod shelf uh, on uh, in my collection the other day and um which has grown considerably recently um but i um i did not have the sky road which is the i think it's the alternative book two of the full revolution um series uh, uh, which of which there are three so this is like our fourth alternative sequel um i don't know much about it i haven't read um uh, this one before I do have a paperback copy, but I'd never got to it, uh, so that's going on my discard pile. So let's have a look. Uh, centuries after its catastrophic deliverance, humanity is again reaching into space, and one young scholar working in the spaceship yard, Clovis Collar Gree, could make the difference between success and failure. For his mysterious lover, Meriel, has su seduced him into the idea of extrapolating the, si the ship's future from the dark archives from the dark archives of the past, a past in which, centuries before, Myra Godwin faced the end of a different space age. Her rockets redundant, her people rebellious, and her borders defenceless against the Sino-Soviet Union. And as Myra appealed to the falling empires of the West for help, she found history turning on her own dubious past and on her present decisions. So it sounds like it flips from the far future to the, to the past, um, which is something that he's done in some of his other books. It's in really nice condition. It didn't cost me much, a few quid, and it is um, a perfectly good first edition. And if I remember rightly, yeah, it is. Um, a little bit like the Cassini division, it is signed by the man himself, Ken McLeod. Very nice indeed. And then I also got um, uh, Eternal Light by Paul McCauley, which is a, um, a pretty well-known space opera. Um, I've been gradually filling out my collection of his books in hardback. This was one of his earlier books. And I think it's loosely linked. I don't know if it's like sequential to 400 Billion Stars, which was his first book, and then Secret Harmonies. Uh, Eternal Light is a radical hard science fiction novel which fuses cutting-edge cosmological speculation about the nature and fate of intelligent life in the universe with a richly atmospheric portrayal of an interstellar society in the throes of enormous political and cultural turmoil. In the aftermath of an interstellar war, an enigmatic star is discovered, travelling towards the solar system from the galactic core. It, its appearance is a new and dangerous factor in the turbulent politics of the inhabited worlds. As, revival, as rival factions, the power holders of the reunited nations, the rebels who secretly oppose their power, and the religious witnesses all see advantages to be gained. But what awesome technology started the star on its journey half a million years ago, and why? Etc, etc, etc. I've actually got three copies of this book now. I've got two in paperback because I didn't realise I already had a copy when I bought it, uh, the second one, and now I've got it in hardback. So the two paperback editions can go and I'll just read the hardback when I get to it. And then there were four books which... Then there were four books which my... Um, <laughs> my darling wife, who um, does occasionally complain about the sheer quantity of books that come through our front door um, at, at my instigation... Um, but she is occasionally something of an enabler. Um, she was in Oxford last Friday and had some time to kill between uh, appointments there. So she popped into the Oxfam bookshop, um, one of the two Oxfam bookshops actually in Oxford, and um, and sent me a photo of the shelves for me to kind of peruse vicariously. And um, and uh, although she only had a few minutes, I had to be quick. There were a few books that I saw there that I, I asked her to get. One was Little Brother by Cory Doctorow. 
Big Brother is watching you. Who is watching back? I can't tell. I think it's... I was about to say I can't tell if it's um, fiction or non-fiction, but it's very much fiction. Um, it's a thriller and a, thought, and a thoughtful polemic on internet-era civil rights, which is, which is very much his bag. He's constantly going on about that kind of thing. And then I've got um, a recent book by M. John Harrison, The Sunken Land Begins to Rise Again. Slightly a mouthful. It's, that was published a few years back. Uh, Shaw had a breakdown, but he's getting himself back together. He has a single room and a job on a decaying London barge and an on-off affair with a doctor's daughter called Victoria, who claims to have seen her first corpse at age 14. It's not ideal, but it's a life, or it would be if Shaw hadn't got himself involved in a conspiracy theory that on dark nights by the, by the river seem less and less theoretical. Meanwhile, Victoria is up in the Midlands, renovating her dead mother's house, trying to make new friends. But what exactly happened to her mother? Why has the local waitress disappeared into a shallow pool in a field behind the house? And why is the town obsessed with that old Victorian morality tale, the water babies? As Shaw and Victoria struggle to maintain their relationship, the sunken lands are rising up again, unnoticed in the shadows around them. Draws a portrait of a watery post-Brexit Britain that, sh that brings shivers of both unease and recognition. So <laughs> I don't know. My one experience of M. John Harrison's writing was so far anyway was the Centauri device, which I didn't hugely get on with. I, I found his prose a little bit too chewy for me. It was a little bit difficult to read. I think um, many people have said that that I need to adjust my reading speed to the complexity of the prose and let that drive the rate at which I progress through the novel. So I think maybe I tried to read the Centauri device too quickly. And then the final book uh, that she um, got for me, my wife that is, um, The Cat's Mother, uh, is Rama Revealed by Arthur C. Clarke and Gentry Lee, which I've got more for completeness sake than anything else. I've got, uh, what have I got? I've got Gardens of Rama. I can't quite remember where they fit in the great scheme of things. Let's see if I can find out. Yeah, so Rama 2 is the sequel to Rendezvous with Rama. The Garden of Rama is the third, which I have in hardback. And then I've got this one too now. What's it called? Rama Revealed. I read, I reread Rendezvous with, easy for me to say, I reread Rendezvous with Rama, there's a lot of R's there, uh, last year. And um, I read it when I was a younger guy, um, maybe even in my teens, and remember really enjoying it. But I actually found it a little bit dry second time around, or nth time around, whatever it was last year. You know, a little bit, a little bit dull in places, actually. I know it's meant to be sort of revelatory and kind of, or inspiring in its in its scale and what have you, but actually not a lot really happens. So as a story, it's um, it's not all that good. Maybe we're um, maybe we're a little bit jaded now by the sort of big dumb object type books. There's been many of them, but I think he, along with Larry Niven with Ringworld, were among the first um, to do that kind of thing. So maybe it was a bit more significant in its time than than maybe it reads now. That's everything in this haul. Uh, if you enjoyed that, then let me point you to some more that you might like to watch. There's a whole bunch of them on my channel. Um, but otherwise, as always, thank you for watching. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>